to a lot of the people responsible for this movie. Uh, first of all, beginning with uh, from the sound department, uh, the re-recording mixer. Uh, Paul Massey has done movies like The Greatest Showman, Deadpool 1 and 2, Pirates of the Caribbean, The Mummy, X-Men Apocalypse, Alien Covenant, The Marsh. As you can tell, he works a lot. Uh, he has had seven Academy Award nominations and has just been nominated for a British Academy Award for this film. So please welcome Paul Massey. And uh, she is also extraordinary. I uh, did all the... Uh, hair and makeup and uh, is also nominated for a uh, BAFTA award and uh, and many other things in her career. Uh, this is her actually her seventh nomination for BAFTA. She's done television and movies there and actually won. Uh, her films include uh, the upcoming Wonder Woman 1984, The Theory of Everything, Les Miserables, X-Men First Class, Tomb Raider, Danish Girl and many other things. Jan Sewell. Okay, and, uh, wow, let's see, who else do we have here? we got so many great people here tonight, I'm so excited. He is the film editor of this movie, but for those of you who are music aficionados in music, you've seen his name for years and years as a composer, uh, and his films uh, include, uh, let me get them all right right here, uh, X-Men 2, Superman Returns, X-Men Apocalypse, The Usual Suspects, Valkyrie, uh, he has been nominated for a BAFTA award for this film, for film editing. He does it all. Please welcome John Ottman. And, well, if ever there was a movie that is a producer's movie, he has struggled for more than a decade to bring this to the screen. This was a dream of his, and he did it. He's a three-time Oscar-nominated uh, Best Pick for Best Picture. He won for The Departed, also nominated for uh, The Aviator and Hugo. Uh, he's been nominated again for the British Academy Award for Best British Film of the Year here, and uh, previously won for Aviator there. Uh, just a terrific producer and the producer of this film. So please welcome Graham King. <laughs> He's walking gingerly because he just had knee surgery, so... Uh, and uh, he's out and about, so congratulations on that too, Graham. Uh, please welcome Golden Globe winner, Rami Malek! Well, they like all of you so much. Um, this is exciting. It's a great theater to see this in. When I first saw the movie, I've seen it a couple of times. I saw it in this theater, and just the sound. Paul is incredible in here, and everything you guys did. Yes. <laughs> all of the elements of this film. But, Graham, I've got to start with you, because I do remember running into you in a restaurant in Beverly Hills and you said, I'm finally going to start this movie in a couple of days that I wanted to do. And, you know, as a producer, it's not easy to get any movie made. This was not easy to get made. This was a long road and it wasn't easy. So talk about why it was so important to you and why you wanted to bring this particular version of the Queen's story to this movie. Um, it was about celebrating the life of Freddie and Queen. And I thought... 10 years ago, if we could create a concert-like atmosphere in a theater, then we could get a hit movie. Well, for me, what Queen and Freddie did so well was bring people together through their music and through the songs. And it was, it was from day one, we had planned a PG-13 film. From day one, we had planned a celebration of Queen and Freddie's life. And I think we got there. I mean, I don't know, I think so. <laughs> Thank you.
And, you know, that was important to you, too, but it wasn't an easy road. It was you know, I mean, you had to get the rights to this. They were very, very protective of this story. You, you have, as executive producers, Roger Taylor, you have Brian May, who were in the band, and, and all of that with, when you're dealing with a true life story. How difficult was that? Well, it's always tough when you get the rights to somebody's life or multiple people's lives to create um, a two hour and 20, 30 minute film out of their lives. And it's always the case of shaping it. And it took so long to, to shape it. And Brian and Roger were so supportive. We would meet every time I was in London and they would ask for an update and I didn't really, it was a very short meeting. <laughs> um, but they knew that we had, you know, that I was striving to get it right. You know, in this business, guys, you get one chance. I mean, we can't, we make movies that we want to, and I think we've all made movies before where you kind of wish you could go back and change it. And I was so sensitive to this story and paranoid about, are we getting it right? Is this the right story to tell of their lives? But it just took a, a hell of a long time um, to get there. And Brian and Roger, like I said, it was we collaborated so well. And, and they was I think Brian May didn't think the film would ever get made after ten years. And, and finally, I called him and I said, "We're making a film." And he just said, <laughs> "Right." <laughs> and, and and then you've got to get into the casting of who plays these guys, and and that's another level of you know how do you find someone to play. Freddie, Brian May, this is, wasn't easy, and it was just about putting it together. And, and um, you know, Clint Eastwood once said to me, You know when the stars align. And when I met this guy, it was done. <laughs> How did he come into the picture? Because obviously, look, he's an Emmy winner for Mr. Robot. People know Rami Malik, but you don't necessarily think Freddie Mercury when you watch Mr. Robot. <laughs> Are, are the other stuff, and I don't think, Rami, I don't think you thought that either. I didn't even, I remember you called me when I was working, uh, I was working on another film and congratulated me for getting an Emmy, so that he knew me before any of that as well. Uh, I'm not before Mr. Robot, but... No, this is uh, Dennis O'Sullivan who works with me. Um, I was in London shooting a film and he called me and he said, I think I found out Freddie. And I said, who's that? And he said, Rami Malek. I kind of thought about it and I didn't, you know, I'd seen um, some Mr. Robot, but I hadn't seen anything else. And he, I said, oh, where's Remy from? And he went, Sherman Oaks. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't sing, he doesn't dance, but I think you should come over and meet with him. But he's eager to learn. <laughs> what was that meaning like, Rami, when you did meet uh, here on the first time? Um, yeah, I was quite shocked. Uh, I th it's like you said, uh, um, I heard that they saw Mr. Robot, and obviously that's uh, a character who would want nothing to do with being on a stage in front of thousands of people. So uh, I was wondering uh, what it was, but obviously Graham and Dennis saw something in me that I think they just needed to see in person. Uh, if, if I had, uh, if one, make sure that I wasn't like Elliot from Mr. Robot, uh, and just talk to me and hear me out. And I think, you know, I was very passionate about it and told them, you know, uh, exactly what Graham said. I'm, I don't play the piano, I, I'm not a singer, but uh, I'll do everything I possibly can. And I said, uh, I said, I'll bleed for this, man. And uh, after a few days at Live Aid, we, did it <laughs> we saw some. We saw some pictures of the piano keys, and there, there was blood on the piano keys. And, and I went, you there a, you go. Were you a Queen fan? Were you like particularly into all of them and everything before you took this on when this came into your life? Not to the degree that I am now. No, I mean now I. <laughs> I guess. Now you can go out on the road, wrong. <laughs> Maybe if, if things get real rough, I'll, I'll go. <laughs> Brian, Roger, give me one song. <laughs> no, I mean now I'm I'm just a complete nut. As is the entire cast. We uh, we listen to it all the time, nonstop. And I guess I'm not afraid to say that. I, I love them. Uh, I love the music. I remember hearing Bohemian Rhapsody as a kid and knowing that that was a very special song. Uh, it just captured me emotionally. It, 
it, it got me straight straight in the gut and then it was also uh, it also kind of tickled me and, and made me feel like uh, I could go dance to that song but also like I said hit deeply emotionally and I, it was the first time I think I found a song that that uh, I think just made me feel a myriad of different emotions in the span of six minutes. You know, these three over here represent an incredible crew. Uh, you know, we don't have everybody. I mean, it takes a village to make a movie like this, from costumes to cinematography and everything. But when I look at your performance, I also see the work of all of them in it. Absolutely. Uh, I. Uh, the one thing I, I love about this job is, is getting to work every day with people who are uh, some of the most talented artists uh, you, can, you can come by. And some things happen on the day, some things happen in post, but it's astonishing to me uh, the collaborative efforts that uh, are combined to create you know, what we see in, in the span of two hours and some minutes. It's, it blows me away every second of it. Uh, Tom Siegel's not here tonight. He was our, our DP, and um, he's just I, visually created something uh, I think very stunning and captures the the periods, uh, the decades, uh, and you know the, his camera work, the way he follows us, um, is sometimes very handheld early on, and eventually moves on to uh, something that's. Um, just more focused and polished in the editing. all kinds of styles too. I love the press conference scene right. where you kind of go ballistic, yeah. and it's just very Fellini's eight and a half all yeah. of a sudden. Yeah. It's, yeah. And that's it's and really so, cool. And so much of that is, is of course, John Ottman. Yeah, this is John Ottman, who's the film editor here, and um, he has a very unique kind of position in this industry because, like I mentioned, he's a great composer, and often he does both those things on a film. But in this case. You're the film editor, but this is a musical film, so you certainly understand the musical aspects of it. Yeah. <laughs> so, I answered the question for him. So, uh, <laughs> there was, there was, we, we all thought there perhaps was going to be score in the film, although we kind of, you know, we kind of knew there wasn't going to be, but um, I would say around three quarters of the way through editing, we realized it would be a mistake because um, it, would, it would take the purity away from the film and um, putting film music in there, and I'm saying this as a film composer, would really make it feel like a movie of the week. And so the, the idea was to, you know, um, take out the vocal tracks of some of the Queen music and, and use their music to score it, and then um, for scenes that would have been underscored, and used the opera, um, because Freddie listened to opera, so it made sense. And then, um, it's the little things that no one usually notices, but in like in the breakup scene where um, Love of My Life is used is on the television set. I actually use that to score the scene and it's very carefully timed out for the most devastating moments of that song to be on particular moments of the scene. And that does for the scene what a score could never do. So, Which you understand from what you do from scoring movies and that's the perfect marriage there of what you do. I guess so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah, so I, 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 you know, it was the ultimate sacrifice not scoring the film, but but um, yeah, it was it was. But you know, you want to do what's right for the film. You know. Yeah. Yeah. You had a lot on your hands. And it, was just, it wasn't just the yeah, yeah. You know, filmmaking. Is People think an editor is just some person on a computer, but there's a lot more to it. You know. <laughs> we all know films is, is a collaboration. It's always a collaboration. But this, you know, in, in, in the body of work that I've done in the past, this one to that to a new level, and I, these are. The, Oh my God, lifesavers, every single one of them. And, and for me to watch these guys and to work with John um, through the post, it was just amazing to watch his work. And um, I didn't get to thank him the other night, but I really <laughs> did thank you all it's okay. for, for <laughs> what they did because everyone put their weight in. Everyone did it for the passion of, of Queen and Freddie. I mean, it's, it's such a difference when you make a film like that. You're doing it over this character that everybody loves rather than like a Marvel movie or something, which I've never done yet. <laughs> now, Jan, you know, you've done so many different movies. This one presented an interesting challenge because you have so much footage to look at, and they're all real, and we've all seen these people before. And so, in approaching that, 
How did you do it? Did you do a lot of research looking at videos and things in, in doing the makeup here and all the different elements of it? Yeah, um, I looked at as much as I could, but um, makeup always comes on a little bit later than you know production design and costume. So there was so much stuff that they'd already had, so I, I was lucky enough to be able to go and see Aaron all his um, work he'd done, all his boards, and, and, and the same with Julian Day the costume design. So there was so much stuff, and they were pushing me all in the right direction. But um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I always like to approach makeup, and it's what's the smallest thing I can do with the biggest impact? Because I, I absolutely love to let the actor, you know, own his own character, which of course Rami really did. Yeah, well, you had all these different time periods in his life too, in Freddie's life, so you had to figure all that out too when you're doing. And what I love too, I've talked to Rami before about this: the teeth, which are very unique. You you worked with those teeth for a long time before you started shooting, right? Right. Yeah, I I had to get used to those, and uh, and Jan made me. I mean, one, I will just say this: I, I, I Jan Sewell is. Uh, Absolutely phenomenal. I could not have done this without her, and uh, I, I hope that we get to work together as often and uh, early as possible. But the, the, yeah, everything was so meticulously done, uh, from you know the different wigs, obviously throughout. Uh, you had just finished I Robot, and you couldn't Mr. grow Robot. Mr. Robot. I'm sorry. <laughs> what do I say? I Robot. I don't say. I I always say I robot. I don't know why I do that. Anyway, but you couldn't grow out your hair fast enough for the film. No, I was trying. I was trying. I had, I had two weeks in between Mr. Robot and getting onto that Live Aid stage. And fortunately, uh, Jan had an incredible wig made that I, I, you know, people still don't know that I hate to demystify this film in any way. But yeah, that's a wig in the Live Aid performance. And... There, uh, please talk about this. Yeah. Well, well, they, well, he, you wear wigs all the way through, as yeah. as do the boys, except for I think um, uh, Joe. I think we used his own hair a couple of times. You um, the extras too, in, in the oh, live yeah, yeah, Seven thousand yeah. wigs, something like that. I had one on. <laughs> <laughs> no one notices my cameo ever, but. <laughs> There's, there's lots of hair work in it, which is fantastic. And then you're going from 1970 all the way up to 80, 85. You know, it's um, it's 15 years, and we, we age the boys slightly because they start off as it's supposed to be 19, 20, and then you know they have to be rock stars 15 years later. So we did little little bits of aging on them, and and you know they all just loved it. I mean, you know, the, it was always fun when they all came bowling into the makeup room. And, um, you were usually fast asleep, because I, had, because I had to put this prosthetic nose on Rami. Uh, <laughs> prosthetics that you had to use for that very unique nose. Well, it, it, I, I mean, I worked very closely with uh, Mark Coulier, who's a fantastic prosthetic guy, and we knew we needed something when we saw Rami. We just knew we needed something. Um, and, you know, he even modeled up cheap pieces, but we didn't need to go that far. But the nose, I, I felt it made uh, such a difference um, because Rami's eyes are, you know, larger than Freddie's and slightly wider apart, and, and <laughs> Freddie had quite an aquiline nose, and, and this, the nose we put on, uh, I think, just did everything for us. And with the hair, um, you know, um, which you know, Rami and all the boys, but particularly Rami's really good at wearing wigs because some, you know, sometimes you put wigs on people. And, they just kind of stiffen up. <laughs> no, he, he, he was good. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know, just uh, to talk about that nose, uh, it was it's very subtle and uh, to the point where you know, we had incredible camera operators and, uh, and uh, camera assistants pulling focus. And I remember Dave Cousins pulling focus on uh, Pete Robertson's camera. Towards the end of the film, uh, we had been talking about uh, my nose just in, in a conversation next to camera. And Dave Cousins, who is you know, getting focused on my eyeballs, you know, on, my, on my cheekbones sometimes, and uh, racking back and forth, he goes, excuse me, you have a prosthetic nose on? <laughs> he couldn't tell that, couldn't tell, yeah. So that's a... There's one shot that's 
hugely close. They, well, those days are a bit nerve-wracking. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, let's talk about the sound challenges of this. And of course, it, it's, it sounds just incredibly perfect when we watch it here, but I know it wasn't easy to do, particularly in the Live Aid scenes where you have to match you know, different tracks in the stadium and everything else and, and mix it. So talk about the challenges that you have. Yeah, well, we were very fortunate that um, Queen has amazing archives of all their original material, all their live concerts, and um, certainly Live Aid. Everything was mixed from the original material, and uh, so I had control on every single instrument in all the performances you just saw, which was just phenomenal. And then we could, that way we could open it all up into Dolby Atmos and um, other formats. We also, um, very early on, I realized um, I wanted to get a stadium feel and a real liveness to the, to the performances as, they, as the band grew into the larger auditoriums at Live Aid. And so um, last summer we had an opportunity to, um, Queen was playing in, in the O2 Stadium in London, and we had an opportunity to play back all of the songs through their PA with no audience in there. And we mic'd it all up with uh, 22 mics all around the stadium. And that way I was able to use those, that, that feel of the stadium to, uh, to add in varying degrees throughout the performance as it grew in the film there and certainly through Live Aid. I think that had a lot to do with you know, managing to make it feel, feel very real. I love the artist sound. I mean, really, that's right. The art, the art, you know. People go, best sound, what's the loudest? That's not that art of sound, you know, when, when we see that every year. And, you know, all your nominations, I think I reeled off seven of them, you know, are so well deserved because it's, it's an art. People don't understand everything that goes into it, too. And I have to say, Rami, you know, because we're listening to Freddie Mercury, I mean, it is his vocals and, and a sound alike, and Rami sort of all combined, mixed yeah. here. And it's the best job. I've ever seen of lip syncing or whatever you want to say on the screen. I've never seen anything like it. I think it's you singing, and that's what we're supposed to think too. But it, what was it like for you in in doing that? I just have, I have to thank Paul because uh, it is. I mean, I I I'll, I'm a stickler for that too. I hate it when I can see yeah. that someone is obviously lip syncing and you. You don't know. I mean, the way it's blended in from you know bits of mine into Freddie's and Mark's is just—it's astonishing. So, thank well, you kudos to you for taking on Freddie's persona because um, it, it was immaculate. It's very easy to make the switches, and I'll never tell where I made the switches. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's seamless. It is seamless. There was one little uh, story. This picture premiered at Wembley. Is that right? Or Wembley Arena? Wembley Arena. And that was a problem for you uh, because you had done all that work with the stadium sound and everything. And so when the movie's going to play there, you actually had to remix it just for one time. Is that right? Yeah, the, the arena is uh, approximately 12,000 seats and it used to be an Olympic uh, swimming pool. So it's just a huge echo chamber. And all of the work that we had done to recreate large stadiums, all of the delays and slaps and reverbs, etc., were going to be more than made up. In, in that arena, so I, I, know, I knew we had to take that out in order to play it for the premiere. Otherwise, it would have just become a complete wash. You wouldn't have had any detail whatsoever. So we were allowed, thank you, Graham, we were allowed to uh, go back in and do a one-time mix for... You went to Graham, the producer, and said, I've got to remix the whole thing for this? I'm sure it got to Graham. <laughs> I did my share of complaining and uh, being horrified by what we were going to do. Because I've gone to plenty of premieres where, you know, one side of the, the, the uh, room is like three stories tall and glass, you know, and uh, it's all horrible. So. We were sitting in a marketing meeting with, with the Fox International guys and we talking about where the premiere in London was going to be. And they mentioned the Odeon, that's the square, and all the usual, even the Royal Albert Hall, and I actually said, how about Wembley? And they just looked at me and said, you know that's mm -hmm. Wembley. And I said, yeah, we could get five, six, seven thousand people. Imagine that atmosphere. And I think a week later, Stacey Schneider called me and said, okay, 
you got it, we're going to go for Wembley. <laughs> this guy was just, what? <laughs> but what a premiere. I mean, to, I mean, I've never seen anything like it to see, especially in London, their hometown, and to see 7,000 people rocking out with Live Aid at the end. I mean, it just gave you the chills. And the best moment was when Brian May walked in and the whole crowd just stomped their feet and they clapped. Right. Yeah. And how about the logo over the Fox, the Fox fanfare? Oh, that was great. I, that was a gift. Brian May called me one day. He goes, I've, we've, Roger and I have just tried something. We're going to email it to you, have a quick listen. It's very rough. But I said, what is it? He said, well, we've read on the Fox fanfare. <laughs> Queen style. And it was amazing. And I straight away came to Stacy and everyone and said, can we do this? Are we legally allowed to do this? <laughs> and it was so great to be at a few previews in Chicago and even Pasadena, where as soon as it came on, people started clapping. So the Queen fans were there. But just while we're on the subject of this, we're poor over here, this guy. I, I mean, we're talking about everything he did, but what he's not telling you is, is he mixed a film with Brian May and Roger Taylor sitting right behind him. Because <laughs> yeah. that was the part when we first discussed him making the film that they wanted to get, obviously, they wanted to be completely involved in. Every chord, every note, every guitar spray, everything. And he sat there with them so patiently. <laughs> And it was just an amazing job that he did. It was a great experience after the first day. <laughs> well, you're like the uh, another member of Queen, essentially there with them, right? That's got to be that's got to be very Let's cool. Let's just stay, say that we spent what collectively how long on that logo? Two days. Yeah, on that logo, right. probably about twenty hours. No, so we were dying because so we had other things to do in the mix. I would get emails going. They're back. <laughs> Yeah, it wasn't two days in a row. It was over a, a long period. But 64 guitars in that logo. And I want to go to some questions from the audience, but I wanted to mention, too, that the Live Aid scenes were the very first scenes you shot, Rami, right? I mean, that's how you started shooting this movie, with that. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I'm glad we did, in, in retrospect. In the, at the time, I thought, wow, this is... Uh, this is going to be the most daunting part, obviously, but it really did galvanize us as, as, uh, as actors and, and the entire crew. We knew we had to start with one of the most difficult things, and if we could get through that, we could quite possibly get through anything, which we did, so, in a weird so Every waking way, moment I had, I would just work on Live Aid, because it was the first thing we shot, so it would torment me every day, because uh, I was doing other things, but it was the Megillah, the monster, that... Uh, kept me up at night. And kept changing throughout, right? Well, yeah, you know, always does. But, uh, yeah, and there's length issues, there was visual effects issues, and, uh, and um, I always say it's the Death Star sequence for our film because everything builds to that moment, and it's like, what about Live Aid? What about this? You're about Live Aid? You know, everything, it's got to pay off and be so cathartic, and, and that's the end of our film. If that didn't work, we were screwed, and we all knew that. So that was, I think, our biggest worry. Yeah, yeah. Cool. You guys have any questions here? Yes, right there in the cap. Yeah. yeah. Hi, Tony Daniels here. Thank you very much, uh, all of you, for bringing Queen the dust deserves. I appreciate that. I'm a big Queen fan for a long time. i just like to know, how long did it take to shoot the whole entire film? The whole entire film? How long did it take to shoot the whole film? The whole film. Yep. What was it? Was it? No, it was more than that. Yeah, 49 or something? 49 days, 50 days, right around there. We added a few days here and there. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Yes? My question is for Yes. Did you feel that you, um, like, kind of embodied Freddie Mercury for playing him that long? Like, he became a part of you? Oh, she's wondering if Freddie Mercury is still a part of you, if you, if you embodied him and for playing him that long. Uh, well... It's the most time I've ever spent in character, I would say. Um, you know, I would try, I would try to keep the, the accent on as much as possible. And, uh, you know, I enjoyed, I enjoyed playing Freddy throughout. So it, you don't necessarily, if you have the opportunity to, to be portraying such a dynamic, audacious human being like that, you, you want to uh, retain as much of that as possible, or at least I did. So, uh, yeah, it was. It, I would find myself at, at restaurants uh, late on, you know, at the end of the night. Sometimes, if I had enough time to go out and grab a bite, sometimes ordering 
with this kind of uh, hybrid Freddie Mercury, Rami Malek accent. <laughs> Probably smoking, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Order some meat pie. All right. Okay, yes, right there. For Rami, what was your method of getting in the Freddie Mercury? Do you do some like cover songs? Do you do some songs? Are you a member of SAG? Who wants to know your process? What is your method? Honestly, so much of it had to do with, you know, I'd come in like this and sit in Jan's chair for two hours, and, you know, that, that is a process in and of itself of you know, slowly entering that world. And, of course, all the, I would be, I said, but I, I was on Mr. Robot and we had two weeks and then came on to shoot this, but... For almost a year prior, I was getting ready with, uh, with uh, movement, um, choreography, working on the dialect with William Conacher, and uh, piano lessons, singing lessons, all of these, and watching archive footage every single day, and listening to him every single day. So. He went off to London, um, and we didn't have the film greenlit. So we had, you know, so I was like, well, should I go and I want to go and start getting into this? Oh, yeah, go, go. Yeah, we're going to get a film. Yes, we're going to get a film made somehow. And, and it was just like that. I mean, it was, and, and, and I'm just going to say thank, thank you to Fox and the Regency because no other studio wanted to make this film for, for getting behind this and in this way. And what an amazing job they've done. I bet they'd want to make it now. Well, I got it. <laughs> I'm sure there's a, there are a lot of, uh, of rock star biopics pouring in Hollywood. Oh my God, yeah. I've been off at four in the last two weeks. <laughs> Amazing. Yes, right in the center. That's you. Yep. Yeah, you, go. That's you, right there. Yeah. Oh, I would like to congratulate you for the Golden Globes, and I wanted to know, um, what's your favorite Queen song? Uh, what's your favorite Queen song? Oh, mine... It's it's a very popular one, but I love somebody to love. Uh, I'm glad it bookends this film so well. <laughs> Anybody else have a favorite Queen song? <laughs> seven, seven Seas of Ride. I kept going around my head. But I don't know how mix of this. Flash Gordon. Yeah! All right. <laughs> Another one bites the dust. Yes, of course. Yeah. <laughs> All of them. All of them, yeah. Yeah, okay, right here. Yes, this one, Romney. Um, I, I have, to be honest with you, I've never heard your name before, and I'll be honest with you sincerely. And when this movie came out, and I saw the performance, and I saw, and then I saw the, the Queen performance, it's amazing how incredible you mimicked his, his, his actions. And we have to give him a round of applause for that, because I think that was an awesome job. Oh, you have already. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> you know, I want to mention, too, that I didn't mention in the beginning, this, this is, you're not only nominated for the Screen Actors Guild Award for Best Actor, but the entire cast is nominated yeah. for Best Cast, which is a huge deal to say uh, to happen. And, I mean, talk about the, uh, a support system. Uh, to go to work, it's hard enough, you know, thinking I got to try to fill his shoes. Uh, Freddie Mercury's, of course, and I could not have done it without without that astonishing cast. Every day, looking into each and every one of their eyes and, and knowing together collectively we're, we were going to get through it, and not only get through it, but uh, rise rise to the occasion. And that's what each and every one of them does, day in and day out. Like I have to compliment their work ethic and. Uh, you know, their ability to bring so much heart and levity to everything. I mean, we, we have become so close. I mean, Jan and I are we're walking and talking about uh, you know, the, the, the boys' love affair with one another. And if you go on Instagram, I can't believe I'm telling people to go on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, you, know, you just watch these, these, this group of individuals, not even just the guys, of course, Lucy Boynton too, but... That, that they are, we collectively are this family, and I've never had this an experience quite like this. I've got close with with uh, other actors before, but 
the bond that this group has will continue for, for many, many years. And the guy that plays John Deacon, you've worked with before, but he is also, yeah. uh, was the uh, kid, the little kid in... Uh, Joe Mazzello is, uh, is the young man in Jurassic Park, and we did a mini-series together called The Pacific, and uh, yeah, we, our paths will keep crossing after forever. <laughs> so cool. Okay. Yeah, way in the back. Yeah, that's you. I didn't know that he had a love affair with a woman for six years and, and uh, eventually proposed to her, so that was, that was a shock to me. Um, what was, everything was, everything about him seemed unusual, and, uh, but, but I loved it. I mean, I could not get enough Freddie Mercury. Even after the film was done, I still was trying to find as much information as I could. He, uh, He's still always going to be somewhat of an enigma to me, even though I do feel like I, I got uh, I got to know him in my own personal way. There's still so much I, I, I wish I did know, and uh, unfortunately, you know, it's not uh, going to be as available to me as I wish it was. It's, I, I get to ask Brian May and Roger Taylor and, and Freddie's sister Cash uh, more. I think more intimate questions than I have in the past, which is nice. I, I feel freedom to do that now. Um, yeah, you become friends with his uh, sister, his real sister, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. She sent a, she sent us a nice congratulations on the glow right? through text. It's amazing, she's been at a movie for the first time. She saw the film for the first time. Just the emotion afterwards. And all of them are, I, mean, we, I screened the film for Brian May and Roger Taylor for the first time on a Sunday morning so I have never been so nervous in my life <laughs> the screening room. and it was there was like four of us in, the, in this small screening room and I didn't say I didn't watch the screen once I just watched Brian May and Roger Taylor's reaction <laughs> so every, every frame and then there was silence at the end that deathly silence and, like, oh, no, please. and they just got up and they, they were in tears and just hugged me and said well worth the 10 years it was so exciting I went to the party after the Globes uh, the other night and I got to meet them for the very first time Brian and Roger and the one thing they said to me this is our story and, and they meant it this, and, and you could see they meant it and were still emotionally moved by it and the whole experience of it which is the best thing you can ask, I guess, as filmmakers, is that you get that on the screen. And I look like a hero. Ten weeks in the top ten, and seven hundred and fifty million dollars, and a golden globe. Yeah. <laughs> what <laughs> the hell? <laughs> okay, we've got time for one or two more. They brought their wives to watch it again. Right? <laughs> okay, yes, because you keep going like this. So, okay. Okay. Don't fight with your audience members here. All right, let's go. The sing-along version of the movie is in theaters, and everyone must go tomorrow. Oh, wow. uh, tomorrow, the sing-along version is in theaters. Is that true? Seven hundred and fifty theaters across the country. Really? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we, we've been doing it internationally for for a while now, and, and I said to Fox, got to Chris Evans in the Fox a couple of weeks ago, we should try this in the U.S. Uh, and we should try this domestically, <laughs> and see if people really want to go to a Queen concert. Oh my God, that would be huge! All right, wow! All right, cool. <laughs> yeah, your question. Oh my God, I love that. I have two cats. I love this question. She's complimenting all the cats. Romeo, I love all the names and everything in the movie. Uh, first of all, working with cats is not an easy thing, I can't imagine. I'm allergic to cats. <laughs> I, I love them, I'm just allergic to them. So. How did you do that? Uh, I try just to I get in and get the heck out of there. <laughs> this is acting, then. This is love. Yeah, that was love. <laughs> I didn't. I well, don't sing. You saw me all of that. You didn't say I'm allergic to cats. That may have been the, the breaker. That would have been. Yeah, I think so. 
There were some things I thought, okay, you got to get over this. <laughs> but you know, cat uh, cat actors are very difficult. I even saying cat actors. I mean, um, the Cohen Brothers movie where they had the cat. They had six different cats. They had running cat, walking cat, on your shoulder cat, and things. So what was that? Was that difficult too? Um, yeah. Well, right. Yeah. Fortunately, the main cat that was used, uh, they got one that would just sit there and purr, so thank God, <laughs> because they are a nightmare to edit and create them. I mean, cats in movies are an illusion, of course, because, you know, wrangling cats, as you've heard the term, so um, they're, they're an illusion, you know, but um, you use, like, slow down effects and so forth to keep them from twitching, you know. That's funny. Okay, yes. Uh, the rela he's asking about the relationship with his wife, the woman, and how did you, yeah, how did you get that, uh, did you, was she involved, or how did that? No, she wasn't involved, um, she read the screenplay, she was um, uh, very happy we were going to offer make this film, but she wanted to step out from it. But, you know, having Brian May and Roger Taylor, and let's not forget uh, Miami Beach, who <laughs> was my producing partner on the film, and, and, and really brought this together with me, um, they lived with that. They lived through the whole time with Freddie and Mary. And in fact, in real life, it was Brian May that introduced um, Freddie to Mary. So we kind of had that story. And that, the story being told in there is pretty much true to life of what happened between them both. So that one wasn't, that part of the story wasn't hard to, to put together. And again, the hours that I spent with Brian and Roger asking them stories about Freddie, themselves, Mary, all the characters, their relationship with Jim Beach. And building all this up, and then of course, you know, we should mention tonight that you know Mike Myers playing Ray Foster. Um, yeah. And Mike, Mike is a good friend, and for many years, I kept saying, "We're going to write a small role for you to say that one line in the film." And and he he was incredible. He 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 said, "I'll be there. I'm coming to London. And I'll, I'll I'll do this for you guys." Um, so. It was really, as I say, that a lot of the years was taken up by the, should we say, tell this part of the story of his life, should we throw this away, should we do that? We went way back to when Freddie was a young boy growing up in Zanzibar, he went to boarding school in Mumbai. Um, so we tried to cover everything and then try to figure out what sticks and what plays for an audience. We have time for like one more, so who has the best question? Okay, you do, go, you got it. All right. Oh, that's interesting. So, in general, what's one thing you know now that you wish you knew when you started acting, Romney Mellon? Oh, that is, that's tough. Uh, what, I, I've, I've learned so much from, I went to, to acting school, uh, went and studied theater for four years, and, you know, nothing really prepared me for just being on set and, uh, you know, I've learned, I, I have a few experiences that I've learned a lot from. I got to watch Robin Williams uh, in, a, in a few movies I did with him and whenever the actors were called to set, he would fly out of his chair and, and be the first person there. And that's something I uh, just respected so much. And it's not necessarily the the thing I know now that I didn't, uh, that I wished I knew before, but it's all these beautiful examples of people like that that I carry with me, and uh, he's one I think about a lot. Graham, what did you learn uh, as a producer now? The audience is always right. <laughs> <laughs> I think I mean preview, 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 uh, and see how, you know, we, I mean, even on this film, you know, we didn't have cars at the end for, for the longest time because I never believe when you make biopics, and I did the Ali movie and the Howard Hughes story, that cars at the end can sometimes feel a bit television-ish. And, you know, I've always been, I'm not going to put cars, we're not going to put cars. And we read a preview, and there was this focus group that just said, we want to know more, we want to know more. And usually producers will say, well, they can go and Google, you know, about their lives. And this one, I remember we, we 
start afterwards and had a conversation, said, we've got to do this, we've got to put cards up. So it's really, as a producer, geared into what the audience really wants and not fight against it, which I don't want to talk about. It's a good lesson. John, what about you? I don't know what to say, except for... Uh, uh, you won't have any friends if you'll be stuck in a dark room for a year. <laughs> <laughs> you literally do say goodbye to your friends and family. Bye. <laughs> John, John looks at every single take, and, but even before. I mean, he'll sometimes grab things that are happening while the camera's just rolling ahead of action. And uh, I think that's an incredible quality that I've picked up. And I'm... I'm uh, I would try to pass that on to any other editor that I'd get to work with. <laughs> Jan? Um, I suppose for me, it's uh, my team, uh, because I knew that I was going to be on set all day uh, with Rami, I wasn't giving that makeup away. And uh, I had the most amazing team behind me, and you are as good as your team. Mm -hmm. So cool. And? Oh, you know, a lot of time to think about it. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I think it's just that every single film brings new challenges and um, never think that you're going to have learned everything you'll ever learn. Every single film, I, I learn something new, uh, there's some, some new angle to it, and uh, so never get overconfident, I guess. And try not to panic. <laughs> and you didn't ask me, but for me, it's knowing when to get off. So let's thank everybody here.